Good afternoon and welcome. This is Engaging Our Communities, a program of Edmonds Community College. I'm Chris Bell, instructor in history and the arts, culture, and civic engagement faculty liaison. Today, my guest is Professor David Montgomery. A 2000, uh, Professor Montgomery, Dave, as he's asked me to call him, is a geomorphologist uh, in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington. A 2008 MacArthur Fellow, an award described by some as the Genius Grant. Professor Montgomery has published widely in such journals as Nature and the Proceedings of the Academy of Sciences. In addition to his academic publications, Professor Montgomery has two books, King of Fish, Th uh, The Thousand Year Run of Salmon, and Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. While both of these works continue to reflect a rigorous scholarship for which Professor Montgomery is known, both are, uh, employ a highly accessible and engaging style and therefore appeal to a much wider audience. Professor Montgomery has been on our campus today as a part of our Earth Day, Earth Month, as a guest speaker in our Brown Bag Lecture Series. Dave, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. Um, we, we just uh, finished up with an engaging uh, talk on the book uh, Dirt, and it was well received, and we had a great audience, so it's a real pleasure to have you here. So. For our audience that may not, uh, for the audience that may not know, um, what is geomorphology? Uh, ge geomorphology is, a, is that part of geology that's kind of the here and now of geology. It's studying the surface of the earth. So the, the evolution of topography, how rivers work, how they erode valleys into mountains, how, land how landscapes are shaped. So it's essentially 100 years ago, I might have been called a topographer. Um, but it, so a geomorphologist is the kind of geologist who studies the processes that shape Earth's dynamic surface. Oh. And uh, how did you get interested in that? Where does, uh, it seems like an esoteric kind of far distant field. Where, where did you uh, <laughs> generate your interest in that one? Uh, in college, I took a class from a guy who taught a wonderful geomorphology class. It was part of the geology curriculum. I, my undergraduate degree is in geology, and as part of that, we needed to take a geomorphology class. And it really captured my imagination. You know, as a kid, I was fascinated by maps. I just, uh, you know, I probably have suffered most of my life from topophilia. I, I really like topography. It's, it's fascinating. I never imagined I could actually make a living studying it. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, there's plenty of somewhat esoteric fields that you actually can make a living at. Um, and it's sort of a longer course than that to actually be ending up in geomorphology. I practiced as a private geologist for a few years doing landslide mapping and sort of doing applied geology things that were really applied geomorphology. Mm. And the further I got into it, the, I just found I kept learning stuff and it was more and more interesting the more I stuck my nose into it. So um, what kinds of things do you actually do? I know field studies are taking you all across the world. The, the audience may be interested in actually what you're doing. What we're actually doing, well, it, it really varies depending on the study. Um, there was a, uh, a project I've been involved with for the last six years now. I've been, I've been looking at uh, evidence for a very large uh, glacial dam burst floods in the eastern Himalaya that uh, we actually found by visiting an area of, of southeastern Tibet that very few geologists and geomorphologists had, had been in and recognized the sort of evidence that a giant glacier had dammed this river, created a big lake behind it, and then the thing had filled up, the lake filled up, the dam was actually made out of ice, ice doesn't make a very good dam, the thing uh, blew out with giant floods. Most of what that involved was driving around in jeeps <laughs> <laughs> and sort of looking at, thing, at, at topography in a different way and putting the pieces of a fairly big puzzle together then making predictions of, oh, well, if we're right about this, we ought to be able to go to this next place on the map and we'll find sand. Mm -hmm. or, and so it's a bit of exploration. Yeah. Other kind of studies involve uh, uh, sort of coring things, drilling down into looking at what the surface layers of the Earth actually hold um, to try and get, find material, say, to carbon date uh, lake sediments to actually understand how long it's been since a deposit was laid down in a lake or how floodplains work. So it's a mixture of sort of field work, of sort of walking around, measuring things, surveying things, laboratory work in terms of getting dates and ages for things, and sort of good old-fashioned good old map work, and uh, increasingly a lot of use of digitized uh, computer-based topography, uh, digital, digital elevation models. Because mm -hmm. uh, you, you can, whole suites of analyses you can do now using computer-based techniques that the geomorphologists of the 19th century couldn't even imagine of ever actually using. And, and uh, so the, what are the applications? What are, what are you striving for? What kind of information? Where does this science uh, uh, um, 
how is it relevant to the layperson? How useful is it? Yeah. Well, um, well, you know, it, frankly, it varies. There's um, at one level, sort of as an academic, I'm very interested in topography for topography's sake. It's fascinating understanding how it it forms. But when you think about um, you know, so the fundamental importance of geomorphology, we live on the surface of the Earth. How it's shaped and what shapes its dynamics really do influence what human societies are able to do. Sometimes what we can do as individuals, where you put your house, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so the more we understand how erosional processes work, um, the better we can understand the distribution of natural hazards. Where might you expect landslides to happen, whether after an earthquake or after somebody clear cuts a steep hillside? Um, how do soils form? Uh, how fast do they form? It's really, as I was talking about in the lecture today, it relates to you know, how long we can farm a particular piece of ground before we literally run out of soil, or the ways in which we farm and how we might be able to use land intensively but actually improve the soils at the same time. Mm -hmm. those, the, how you address those problems are all rooted in applied geomorphology. Yeah. I saw a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday Times, you and a colleague had an editorial about the, the dam down in, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, the Green River. The Green yes. River, yeah. And, uh, and recommendations for there, right? I mean, they were seeking your expertise there. Yeah, yeah. and in a sense, if you look at uh, uh, flood control and flood management and flood hazards in the Northwest, understanding the way the valley bottoms are shaped and how the discharges in our rivers are shaped, um, and what happens when you, uh, as a, uh, when one dams a river, and how that can influence the way people perceive the risk downstream, right. um, are all examples of applied geomorphology. And mm -hmm. so, um, one of the things I've been working on, uh, oh, maybe for the last 10 years now around this area, is looking at the big valley bottoms and their geomorphology, how they're shaped, um, um, and what kind of lessons we can learn in terms of why is it that it's so expensive to essentially keep doing the same things in places that are subjected to flooding repeatedly? And there's certain floodplains in the region that are actually, uh, that behave differently than others, and yet we don't tend to treat them differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so understanding the sort of the, uh, what you might call the, the natural template of the landscape is something that can be, it, frankly, can save people a lot of money by saving them from ma making mistakes. Uh, and it can also point towards solutions about how you'd actually manage a problem once it's actually uh, engaged. So your work as a geomorphologist led to this book that we were discussing today at the lecture, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. Um, tell our audience in general what this book is about. Well, it's, it's a book that explores the role of soil in the, the history of human civilizations. Because um, soil is essentially one of our most valuable but least valued resources. Uh, all we, almost all of our foods, and like 97% of it, comes directly or indirectly out of the soil. And it turns out that the very sort of iconic act of farming, plowing, the kind of thing that if you listen to country radio, the, the, you know, the description of what do farmers do, they plow. It's, yeah. it's the traditional yeah. agricultural method for thousands of years in many parts of the world. Leaves the soil bare and vulnerable to wind or rain, for erosion by wind or rain for some part of the year. And that can, that can allow soil erosion to race well ahead of soil production. And you can think of a soil as something that's made from the weathering and breakdown of rocks and the mixing with biological material to make fertile soil. But it's also ero lost to erosion if you're on any kind of a hill slope. Soil's gradually moving down slope. And that balance between the two is essentially at the heart of the book. Because if there's an imbalance, if erosion proceeds faster than soil production, then we're essentially losing soil. And that can obviously only go on for so long before it has an influence on what you can grow in the soil. Mm -hmm. um, and so the central thesis of the book is that the way people have treated land, in particular using plow-based agriculture, has resulted in long-term erosion and loss of the soil that's affected the course and fate of many, not all, but most human societies. Um, and So are, are, we, are you suggesting in some way that soil erosion has actually determined history and the life of civilization or uh, yeah indirectly yeah indirectly uh -huh. um, there's it's because it's a slow process you know globally we're losing soils at a pace of about a millimeter a year at, at present uh, so it, it's really slow your fingers your fingernails right. grow faster than that yeah. um, but over long enough it can actually sustain it can shape the course and fate of human societies uh, with the idea that uh, civilizations that have an abundance of thick, fertile soil can expand, can uh, increase food production, can increase their population. 
But once you start to essentially be limited, uh, to essentially so that each generation's supply of soil is less than the last, you have the, the opposite problem of essentially a growing population and a shrinking land base. That's where we find ourselves today viewed globally. Mm -hmm. um, and in past societies, that hasn't played out all that well. Now, soil erosion probably wasn't the ultimate trigger that took down most ancient societies. But the argument I make in the book is that it's essentially the process that influenced the resilience of human societies is directly tied to the way they treated land. Um, and you can only lose soil for so long before the resilience of a society starts to wear thin. And then a climate change, hostile neighbors, um, other kinds of factors could play into actually terminating a society. Um, and my essential argument is that soil erosion was part of what shaped the broad course and evolution, the sort of the long wavelength, if you will, peaks and troughs of human societies. So uh, an example would be Rome. A part of the fall of the Roman Empire, Roman civilization, had to do with how they treated their land and this problem of soil erosion? Uh, that's the argument that I make, yeah. yeah. That, and essentially, the, the way I think to view the Roman Empire is one that uh, farming early on in the Roman uh, experience was sort of small-scale, uh, multi-story canopy farms that were pretty good at conserving the soil from all that we can tell. And partway through their history, around the time of their, the change from the their republic to an empire, um, Roman farming practices fundamentally changed to large-scale industrial monocultures. Uh, not unlike those we have today, but obviously yeah. with different technology. Um, and over time, the soils of central Italy, the, the Roman heartland, essentially were eroded off, um, and leading to the development downstream of things like the Pontine marshes, then not the healthiest part of the Roman world, and the famous silting in of the harbors in the Roman heartland. The port of Ostia is now miles inland because all the, uh, the dirt that ended up uh, uh, being deposited off the coast. But with the erosion, with the limitation of agriculture in the Roman heartland, did I argued, was essentially increase the reliance on the, the colonies for feeding the Roman heartland. Mm -hmm. And that's an, uh, um, what that did is essentially made them dependent on maintaining essentially an empire to maintain the core. So in effect, you could think of the Roman Empire as having ended up being rotten to the core in terms of agricultural production, so that once they weren't able to maintain the colonies, the whole thing started to collapse inward. Yeah. Um, now, that's a gross oversimplification right. of Roman history. But, but clearly, it's but that's a the lens factor. I look at. Yeah, it's a factor. Yeah. It, leads, it leads them susceptible to political problems, exactly. problems from their neighbors, and the like, and has to do. Exactly. I think the way to look at the way that people have treated land and the feedback on human societies really is through the lens of resilience. Um, in that um, degraded land doesn't leave the society that is built upon it very resilient to the other kinds of change. Yeah. Um, there's a chapter in the book uh, that describes a similar um, uh, history in the United States. I, th I found it fascinating that uh, we're conne we connected soil erosion to the onset of the Civil War. Mm. Explain that. Yeah, well, that was one of those interesting things that I didn't really realize those connections when I was starting the research for the book uh -huh. and sort of developed the ideas as I, as I went through it. But the basic idea is that uh, um, plantation agriculture in the American South early on in the history of colonization was one where you could only get a few years of very fertile tobacco crops out of a freshly cleared piece of land. Um, and so you needed to move agriculture around um, uh, to maintain, and so it, to maintain a fairly large scale agricultural operation, you needed a very large amount of land. This right. led essentially tobacco is really hard on the land, and and you have to once you uh, use up the fertility, you've got to move to to another one, right? Yeah, and it only takes about three to five years yeah. for that to happen um, through a combination of both uh, tobacco being a very uh, uh, a crop that's very hard in the nutrient load of the soil, but also the way that colonial agriculture was practiced with sort of a bare earth piled around individual tobacco plants. Uh, was a recipe for losing soil rapidly. So the combination of erosion and soil degradation uh, made it so that you could only farm one place for three to five years, then you'd move to a new part. So mm -hmm. you, you needed a whole lot of land to be, able to, uh, to be able to operate in any one year on a small piece of it, given that you could only use a piece for a few years. And so um, that led to a, uh, uh, it encouraged large-scale farms for plantations, and right. in combination with slave-based labor, um, it really led to the growth and development of plantation agriculture in the South, um, and that slave-based labor was um, well-suited, how as heinous as it may 
B. Yeah. Economically, at the time, it was well suited to the model of very large scale production because you could move your labor and your activity around to different parts of the plantation. So what happened in the run-up to the Civil War is that the, the, the reliance of Southern agriculture on large plantations um, essentially was driven by the erosive nature of, of agriculture. You couldn't keep doing it on a small area. Um, and so the move to essentially limit the um, sale of slaves in new states was something that was very uh, a very deep concern to the plantation owners in the South because by the time of the Civil War they were generating half their income by selling slaves to the new states. Right. And so it was viewed as a very direct economic attack on the livelihood of the upper crust of Southern society. And in many ways it was the move to restrict the spread of slavery rather than the issue of slavery per se that blew the country apart in the Civil War. Because uh, the issue of uh, the abolition of slavery was not even on the table until after the Civil War. The discussion was all about whether Texas and California and the states to the west would be, um, whether slave labor slave. would be allowed there. Right. Um, and you know, and it's, it seems, you know, today through our sort of a modern lens, it seems like kind of crazy people are even arguing about right. whether to allow slavery. Right. But in the context of the times, there was this connection between the way that agriculture was, was uh, um, developed on the land, the, and the reasons for that going back to the, ero the um, issues of erosion, among other things, um, and how the whole system was set up in terms of the importance of the to the economy of the South. Now, in starting to write a book about soil erosion and the role of its role in human history, I never imagined that there'd be a connection to right. essentially the run-up and start of the Civil War. Yet the more you look into it, the more a lot of these pieces are really connected in terms of the way um, the sort of the coupling between uh, sort of our culture, our economy, and our politics, um, and then the ability of the land to sustain societies. Um, there's lots of different combinations, um, but you s one sees similar patterns uh, repeated through history as well. Yeah. This pattern, again, in American history, um, is repeated in the 1930s. In the middle of the Depression, we have the Dust Bowl, and uh, similar kinds of things happened here. Monoculture, use of the land. Tell our audience about that one. Yeah, well, the, the Dust Bowl is essentially, I like to call it, sort of the, one of the bigger man-made disasters that's, that's uh, happened. Or sort of a man-made natural disaster might be an even better way to put it. Because uh, we all sort of know that the great drought in the 1930s triggered the Dust Bowl, but the land was well prepared to fall apart due to the extensive plowing of the Great Plains that happened in the early 20th century. In great part, in response to the um, incredible export market for wheat during the First World War. Um, there were real opportunities for farmers in the Midwest to um, cash out, if you will, on the market of selling uh, grain to Europe while the Europeans were busy killing each other during the First World War right. and not growing their own food. Yeah. Um, and once they expanded agricultural production into some of the drier, more marginal areas for, for cropping in the, in the uh, Western Plains, um, you know, once you bought into a piece of land, you need to pay the land off, you need to pay the machinery off, you need to pay off your fertilizers or agricultural chemicals. Um, farmers, in effect, were sort of over leveraged. They were continuing to try and work the land hard. Mm -hmm. And so when the next big drought came, uh, much of the plains was plowed and the upper parts of the soil dried off and blew away. Why? Well, because those soils were actually wind deposited in the first place. Mm -hmm. A lot of the soils of the American Midwest are uh, so-called loose soils, so it's just sort of silt-sized stuff. Yeah. That stuff had, was essentially the ancient soils of Canada that during the ice ages from 3 million to about 10,000 years ago, the repeated cycles of glacial advance essentially scraped the soil off Canada, which is why it's you know, there's thin soils over most of Arctic Canada. That stuff all got pushed down in front of the glaciers and it blew around the Midwest and got deposited by winds to create this incredible breadbasket of agricultural productivity we know as the Midwest. Yeah. But it was the grass that kept it together, that held it there. Because, uh, you know, the, the high winds blowing off the, uh, from the north and off the Rockies, uh, uh, if the soil was bare and dry, could just pick it up and move it. And well, because you know, put it there in the first place, it could pick it up and take it away. Yeah. Um, and much of the biomass in the Great Plains was originally below ground. It was in the root system of the soils. So once the, the sod was broken and the land was plowed, there literally wasn't much holding the soil in place anymore. So then the next big drought, you had these great clouds of dust that blew off the Midwest and uh, gave the Dust Bowl its name. And um, 
uh, those clouds made it all the way to the eastern seaboard where people got really in the population centers of American society at that point. And people got very concerned about it. And it started sort of the, some of the first efforts to actually try and conserve soils. Mm. Are we at risk of uh, something happening, you know, that happening again? You know, probably not, we're not probably at the same, anywhere near the same level of risk of sort of a dust bowl too. Mm -hmm. um, what I think we're really at risk for though globally is falling prey to the, the long-term creeping problem that if you look at the numbers for soil loss globally, on average, the way that I've crunched the numbers, we're losing somewhere upward of a millimeter a year of soil off our croplands um, on average. And that may sound like a fairly small number, but it's only 25 years to make an inch. And mm -hmm. if there's only six inches of topsoil on average in many places of the world, then that's less, that's what, 150 years to lose it all. And to a geologist like myself, 150 years is nothing in terms of time. But the problem, of course, is that uh, it's forever in terms of politics. Um, you know, something beyond next week seems to be forever in terms of politics these days. But um, the simple fact that we, as a species, are utterly dependent on the productivity of the soils that we use to grow our food should be viewed as uh, sort of at odds with the problem that if we're losing soils on average, that can't be sustained, no matter what the rate. We need to basically relearn how to farm in ways that will allow conserving the soils over the long run if we're to have a long run ourselves as a society. How, um, if we do not change our habits and we lose the, that inch of soil in how long a period? Oh, it's like 25, it's a millimeter 20, year, so yeah. 25 years to lose about an inch, and if you deal with six inches to a foot of top soil, you're talking a century and a half to two centuries to physically lose it all. Yeah. But it can greatly decrease agricultural productivity way before you lose it all. So uh, the United States is a civilization over the course of the next 200, 500, 1,000 years may run the risk of not being here? Well, you know, I, I, all societies on Earth run the, that risk over the next 500 years, if yeah. you look at it that way. Uh -huh. um, there are three parts of the planet that are endowed with very thick natural deposits, if you will, of soils, of these loose soils in particular. And those are the areas where the glaciers sort of robbed the polar regions of their soil and pushed it south during the glaciation. Those are the American Midwest, um, Eastern Europe, and Northern China. The, the sort of the places at the southern limit of the great ice sheets from mm -hmm. the Ice Age. Many of those places could sustain even the most erosive farming practices for many generations to come because the, the soil's not thick, but the loess that can become soil pretty quickly or that is very fertile even without being mixed with a lot of biological material to make fertile soil, the, the actual mineral soil is incredibly fertile and productive. Mm -hmm. Most of the planet, though, is only covered by about a foot to a couple feet. Um, so, um, if you look globally, in the next 50 years, the projections are for the human population to you know, virtually double up to like 10 or 12 billion from the current six plus billion. We're also projected though to um, essentially continue losing global cropland. So if you simply take the sort of agricultural productivity per hectare today, and you look out 50 years, we have to figure out how to double it in order to um, feed everybody mm -hmm. that we project will be around. And that requires doing either doubling the total acreage under crop production or doubling the, um, the yield per hectare uh, in crop production. And there's not a lot of parts of the planet that we could actually clear and farm sustainably that we're not already doing so. A lot of the sort of like tropical rainforests, it, you would, it would be like tobacco cultivation in the, in the American colonies. Mm -hmm. You'd get a few years of production out of it and then you'd have exhausted the soil. It couldn't be sustained. Um, and that suggests that we've got to learn really how to essentially increase crop yields at a time when we're projected to be running short on cheap fossil fuels. Um, so if there's one thing we can sort of forecast, I think fairly confidently this century, is that the price of oil is going to go up. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's sure. not, it's not going to come down yeah. much uh, in the future. Or if it does, it'll be a temporary blip. Um, and yet we use an awful lot of uh, uh, fossil fuels to generate the nitrogen-based fertilizers that we use to, as a substitute for native soil fertility at the moment. Um, I don't think that's sustainable. We're going to need to relearn how to do um, essentially organic farming on a really large scale. And that's a real challenge as to how to do that. Um, some of the highest crop yields that, we, that are found on the planet are from very small scale, labor intensive organic farms. But how do you do very large farms 
in a way that are not erosive and organic and that can essentially sustain soil fertility even as we derive our sustenance from them. It's a real challenge and that's where research ought to be focused. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have some possible solutions? Can we uh, solve these problems with technology? Uh, new kinds of fertilizers or uh, genetically modified seeds or um, other aspects? I mean, can't science solve this problem for us? Or do we have to go back to some sort of old time farming? I mean, uh, well, you know, I'd argue that old time farming and science aren't necessarily diametrically opposed uh -huh. in that I think that the real challenge with thinking about how science and technology may help get us out of this problem. And, and at heart, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm by nature an optimist uh -huh. um, or maybe by choice an optimist. Uh -huh. um, and, but the challenge, I think, is to think about the contributions that science can make, not in the traditional ways we've been thinking about it in terms of a new genetically modified organism or uh, new ways of developing chemical fertilizers or pesticides, because those are the, the former is based on the uh, essentially what you might call a techno-arrogance idea, the, the idea that uh, we will benefit more than the surprises that might have a, a dark side to them that will come from things. Um, and in developing new technologies, you've got to watch out for the double-edged sword. Um, and we're gonna, we can return to that in a minute. But the, um, the philosophy that has underpinned a lot of, of agro-technological development in the last hundred years has been one of essentially treating the soil as a substrate to prop plants up as we add the nutrients that we need to grow them. Mm -hmm. And it's my contention uh, that what we need to do is rethink agricultural technology with, as having its foundation in ecology rather than chemistry. Because if we look at the source of fertility on uh, most native soils, it's through the interaction of organisms. It's the um, the, the, the decay of some organisms that are feeding others, it's the microbial activity that is taking the building blocks of organic matter and breaking them down to be the raw materials for new life that then harvests CO2 from the atmosphere to create new, you know, using solar energy to create new life that we can then draw our food from. And if we think about soils as, from an ecological perspective as how to basically enhance the life within the soils so that we can skim a little off the top as the cycles go around rather than how can we essentially treat it as a chemistry experiment to sort of produce food that we can then mine. That's a philosophical change more mm -hmm. than a technological one. Yeah. And my contention would be that uh, technology appro applied appropriately, uh, there's no reason that organic farming shouldn't be high tech. Uh, it just may not involve you know, like fertilizers and GMO approaches, mm -hmm. but could very much involve sort of the, the pinpoint application of, um, of technology, whether it's for watering or for uh, dealing with composting and returning nutrients, rethinking um, uh, organic waste streams from cities, so returning organic matter to the land. Yeah, so uh, I sort of explain then how you define organic farming. What what would that mean, and how would that work, and, well, you know, and where a, would that work? You know, there's a lot of arguments about what that is actually constitute, it, yeah. um, but the I sort of view it as uh, a key component to it should be the return of organic matter to the land. Um, and treating the soil as, as essentially, not so much as a living organism, but as a collection of living organisms, as an ecosystem. Um, and trying to promote life within it rather than actually trying to eliminate life within it, which is obviously what herbicides and pesticides are intended to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're the only species that I've ever heard of that poisons soil or it poisons the land to feed itself. Um, and in the end, that's what herbicides and pesticides are, and over-application of nitrogen fertilizers are. It's, a, it's sort of a broad spectrum um, uh, poison that uh, leaves the part that we want. Rethinking that would be uh, thinking about, uh, in terms of conventional agriculture, how do we get away from the plow? How do we get away from you know, sort of losing soil? Um, and the answer there may be no-till agriculture. Um, I have a, a good So no-till is not digging up the earth? It's not turning it over. So like a plow is intended to turn the earth over as the, the, the precursor act of farming. What no-till does is essentially plants through the crop stubble of last year. So you essentially you can take the stubble, knock it down, plant through it, essentially inject the seeds down below the, um, the stubble of last year's uh, uh, crops. In effect, it's like a natural compost. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a natural mulch. It could help retain water in the soil and can also um, uh, help return organic matter to the soil that then decays and essentially increases soil fertility as well. Um, and that's sort of a, me a mechanical difference of how to think about plowing versus non-plowing. Mm -hmm. um, 
But in terms of organic agriculture, um, you know, returning organic matter to the soil can actually help enhance soil fertility as well. Returning, uh, uh, promoting uh, beneficial micro soil mycorrhizae um, and um, uh, beneficial soil organisms uh, can help promote soil fertility. Um, and those are completely inconsistent with the ideas of essentially broad spectrum pesticides and herbicides. Um, my guest is David Montgomery. He's the author of Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization. We've been discussing that for um, the last half hour. Uh, um, let's um, switch gears somewhat. The, I found uh, one of the fascinating aspects of the book was um, tying the science and geomorphology to the historical written record. Yeah. So you went to uh, Rome and you looked at Cato, or you, you went to Greece and you read Aristotle, and you found in their writings uh, a, um, a uh, justification of the science, and the science in that went, went and, and uh, explained well their, uh, their writings. So um, uh, tell me a little bit about the science of geomor geomorphology. How did you go about reading the soil of ancient histories, and, and, and how does that work? Well, well you know, it's obviously one of the things that I find fascinating is mm -hmm. going back and looking at historical documentation and records and sort of filtering it, through, if you will, through the eyes of a geomorphologist. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's some risk of sort of the old anecdote of sort of like, you know, looking for the answer under the light, looking for your keys under the light post, right? Yeah. You see what, you, what you're trained to see. And, um, uh, but I think that if, if you go back and look through historical documentation with training in a particular area, you can start to see sort of patterns and commonalities. You can start drawing together a story that might not have been apparent to the authors at the time. Um, and there runs some risk of not necessarily capturing the whole story, obviously, but, um, but can paint a broad enough picture that you can start saying, yeah, I think there's a connection here. Um, and so thinking about the way, well, one of the things I tried to do is to essentially um, couple the kind of historian's view of uh, uh, what people at that time were thinking and writing about and noticing, with going back and finding the contemporary studies of those same areas and going, okay, someone who's gone and studied and tried to reconstruct how erosion was happening, say, in the Roman heartland at the height of the empire, what'd they find? Does it back up my view of how I would read the historic sources? Yeah. And it's that kind of triangulation where you can start to really put it into focus. Um, and so it's, you know, A, it, it's fun to read the old stuff. I, I mean, I never would have gone back and read Cato if I wasn't writing this uh, book, right? Uh. It's just not high in one recreational <laughs> reading list. Um, but it turns out In the original fat. Latin, too. Oh, right? yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have taken me a long time. Yeah. Fortunately, the translations have been done. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the fun things really is sort of finding these little gems and trying to put them together and then finding the studies to try and see whether or not one has faith in one's reading of that old stuff, uh, filtered through one's training and expertise. And it's what I was finding is where I could find places that that kind of, those three pieces of it all fit together, I was pretty confident about it. Um, yeah. So um, give us a sense of the actual science uh, we were talking on the way in. How do we get these core samples from the, from the lake bend? And uh, how do we uh, uh, measure the loss of soils and, and, uh, and the like? Well, there's a, one of the really neat things about geomorphology is there's all kinds of tools for different applications. It's a pretty wide open toolkit. Mm -hmm. But for things like uh, the erosion rates in the Roman heartland, um, one of the techniques that a guy named Sheldon Judson, I believe, used uh, back in the 1960s was looking at, he'd find places where there was a, a lake where you could identify the area contributing uh, runoff to that lake. Mm -hmm. So you could then go to the lake drill a core in the middle of it, and usually what geomorphologists do, since it, we're usually low budget science, is you get a, a makeshift raft, and uh -huh. you float out in the middle of the lake, and you have a hole in the middle of your raft, and you take a drilling core, and you try and drill down through it, drop it down to the lake bed, and then push a core down into the lake bed, and then take it down as far as you can go. And then you pull it out, and you get a core. You get the, a sample of the stuff that was at the lake bed. And if you can find organic matter that you can carbon date at different levels, you, uh, the, uh, what a carbon date will do is it basically tells you when the organism that made that carbon died. Because mm -hmm. living organisms maintain the same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 as the atmosphere. But 
when you die, the carbon-14 starts to decay at a known rate. So you can go measure that ratio in something that, in something you dig out of the bottom of a lake, yeah. and you can tell when it died. And if you assume that, well, it died before it got buried under the lake, which yeah. is usually a pretty good assumption, or yeah. if not, it did shortly thereafter, uh -huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can basically do that in a number of levels, and then you've got essentially a distance and a time. You can get a rate at which stuff was going into the lake. I you see. can then yeah. sort of unfold that to go, oh, if you do that at enough levels, you can look for changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, in many places around the world, if you do that on lakes, you can pick up where farming started because you have a very slow accumulation of dirt in the bottom of a lake until farming starts, and then it goes up really fast, meaning a lot of stuff was coming off the hillsides and ending up in the, mm -hmm. in the lake. And you can do the same thing with, with floodplains, with uh, estuaries or marshes. There's a lot of places where one can try and get at that kind of data. Um, but there's a, there's a whole host of techniques that one can use. Um, some of them are more fun than others. Right, <laughs> right I can imagine. But then, then you're able to see the pattern, right? Settlement, yeah. agriculture, growth of a population, they need to move and spread out. That means they go to more marginal lands in order to farm. That means hillsides. You see a, a sediment coming off the hillsides and so forth, right? Have I got that right? Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's about right. Farming yeah. usually starts on valley bottoms in, yeah. uh, for most societies because valley bottoms are, and particularly river floodplains, they're well watered. The water comes to you. Uh, it's flat, easily worked land. The soils are rich and fertile. Great place to farm. And as populations rise, farming tends to spread up under the hillside environments. Um, where the soils are not replenished by annual flooding and there's mm -hmm. only so much of it. And once the plow goes to work on a steep hillside, you essentially start the clock ticking on wearing down the soil. And if you have a society that is um, adapted to farming a whole landscape, but over time the hill slopes start to become less productive, you then have a, either your technology has to keep up and keep increasing the productivity at the valley bottom so you can keep supporting all those people who used to eat the food off the hillsides, or you end up with more people than the land can support. Um, and that's, that sort of cycle of sort of boom, expansion, and eventual bust seems to characterize an awful lot of human societies over, over about the time scales you would expect of you know, an 800 to maybe a twice that long, 15, 1600 year long um, uh, record of, of being able to right. plow before you run out of soils on the hillsides. And so we've seen then, and you can you go through the chapters of your book here, each of these major civilizations that has had a lifespan somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 years. Yeah, and, more or less. And yeah. the science seems to, to, to tag it to the, the, the loss of soil, right? And well, there's an association with the yeah, loss of soil. Yeah. And so one, one of the things I was trying to do in the book, uh, since there weren't people you know, collecting erosion rate data. Right. You know, the, the Romans didn't have an army of geomorphologists right. out measuring erosion rates. Yeah. Um, so you just, it's again, you have to try and triangulate, looking back through history. Um, and there's been enough places where the, the geological work in terms of when the erosion was happening has been done in conjunction with the archeological work to know that when was the population expanding, when was it contracting, to paint the, the um, connection between the rise of populations and the erosion of the soil. The real question, of course, is, is, is there a causal connection on the decrease of soil erosion later in the collapse of the populations? Did people p literally run out of soil, mm -hmm. or did they all die off from disease and then stop farming so the soil erosion right, went down? Right. It can be hard to make the causality argument, yeah. um, which is one of the reasons I actually did a lot of work in trying to uh, document rates of erosion in the modern world where we have that kind of data, right. where we can actually make the direct comparisons. Because right. frankly, it's really hard to do with the, with the ancient society case. Yeah. You're kind of arguing by, uh, by connection and triangulation and f firmly asserting causality can be a dangerous game in that. Uh, so one of the things I did is compile the erosion rate data for the modern world to try and ask the question of, well, or do the numbers pencil out as, as uh, making that last connection, that closing of the loop, a reasonable proposition? Mm -hmm. and, and obviously I concluded it was or I would have written a different book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so what's next up for you? Uh, Dirt is doing well and, and um, it's uh, had a nice run and uh, where are you taking your research from here? Is there another or a book or two on the horizon? Well, yeah, there is, in fact. Um, essentially, one of the things that I learned uh, while I was writing Dirt that I was surprised by uh, was something that my wife taught me. And she taught me by um, 
uh, example. She's mm -hmm. uh, an organic gardener. She's been uh, transforming our yard from when we bought a, a lot in North Seattle with sort of a ratty lawn. She's turned it into um, something that has uh, very life-filled soil, a lot of trees growing on it now. Uh, she's growing a bunch of our food in the backyard. Um, she essentially breathed life back into our soils that had already been depleted uh, uh -huh. in my yard for different reasons than the ones I talk about in the book. It was a glacier that did it with, with yeah. till in our yeah. yard and then developing it in the neighborhood. But uh, the point is, is that she restored life to our soils and generated very rich organic soils in less than a decade in her backyard. So as I was sitting writing a book about the decline in, of soils and its influence on society after society, she was showing me that we can rebuild soils faster than we degraded them, but that it takes two things. Labor was a lot of work, yeah. and organic matter. It took a lot of organic matter. Mm. Um, but if you look at two of the things that we have in urban environments around the world, it's labor and organic matter. Organic, yeah. um, and so we're working on a book that's a sequel to Dirt, that is sort of the, the case for global soil restoration, and how it's feasible. It's doable. We can do it. Uh, and a time scale that would make a big difference to the, to the course of this century if we rethought about the way we treat land and we rethought about the way we use land, both in cities and on farms. And so we're, that book, we're, we're just starting. We're going to uh, put a good bit of effort, I think, into writing that together this summer and sort of tell both our experience in our yard and then the connection to the broader uh, the And broader this, is so, this is sort of a memoir then? Of yeah, sort of, half, yeah. sort of half memoir and, and half... Uh, the antidote or the, the solution to the global soil problem right. and how a lot of it is actually fairly clear, simple, and obvious. Uh, it's sitting below our feet every day as we walk around, but we just don't think about it that way. And it, it appears that uh, farming in the city is one of those solutions, right? Yes, I think it, it could actually be a really big part of a solution to um, the problem of how to feed the world in this next century. Um, and it could also help contribute to the carbon problem in the sense of the more food we grow closer to people, the less we have to ship it around the planet. Um, now, we'll, I don't think we'll ever sort of feed cities completely with, within urban agriculture because gr grains and dairy are kind of hard to do within the city. Um, but we could grow an awful lot of our fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, we could grow a lot of our produce within cities. Um, and it could help contribute to sort of a source of, to a source of healthy fresh food for many of the populations uh, in the developed world that don't have access to them, and it could also help contribute to the problem of feeding the chronically hungry in the developing world. Um, so it's you know, urban agriculture. I think is a real interesting um, idea whose time has come, and that we could be doing a lot more to foster as a society. Yeah. My guest has been David Montgomery. He's the author of Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. It's a marvelous read, and I'd recommend that you all go out and buy it. David, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much. It's okay. a pleasure to talk to you.